So the first lens I would like you to use as you think through, as you move from adaptive challenge to re adaptive response. I'm going to use the word response just so I don't use the word program. Because once you think program, um, so response. Response can be a strategy, a program, a project, any variety of things. So the first, and I'll, and I'll keep these up later. So the first, the first key is, how do I use the four scenarios, the four spiritual religious profiles as a lens for developing my strategies? Different strategies for each one, or are different versions of the same strategy, but focused on each of the four, or add-ons to a particular program that broadens and is more inclusive. Remember, the key, of, the key in the four scenarios is targeting and expanding. Targeting the needs, but expanding our ways of doing things. Just being more inclusive, being more inclusive, being more inclusive. So far, so good? You have question marks on your face. What's the questions? You all right? OK. My second one is this. You should take advantage of all these four contexts for thinking about ministry. Okay. I'm going to give you two examples in a minute. I started using this diagram to keep the connection among these four arenas or contexts of ministry. You don't have this, by the way. So don't look, all right? But you'll, you'll see, and I'll put it back up later for you. How do we connect in one strategy or project, church life, daily life, community life, meaning the out there, and online life. So I do a lot of training with thinking about how do we use the digital tools in faith formation, particularly in church life. And people often see these as either or choices. And so what I'm trying to communicate in this diagram is it's not either or choices. It's all of those. So how do I connect church life with daily life, perhaps using online life? I'll show you this in a minute. Or how do I plant ourselves in the community so it's a way to impact people's daily lives that through online that might actually get people connected to us in church life. So you've got these three areas in which you do programs, activities, strategies, but they're four contexts. Does that make sense? And so, well, I'm going to give you examples in a minute. So think of them as pathways as you create a strategy. So how will your strategies connect church life, what you do on campus, so think of vacation Bible school, okay? Think of a particular ministry you do on campus. To daily life, the way people live their lives 24-7, 365, and, and using online life, meaning website, online resources and learning, digital methods, webinars, video, whatever it might be, to keep people connected. This is an example where you have precious little time with people really on campus in a given week, an hour or two for most people. And we want to impact how they live their daily lives as Christians out there in the real world. And the online life can surround them with 24-7, 365 content and connections. So it's really all three create this new approach to staying connected with people. Or maybe we do outreach into the community. Maybe it's service or mission, or we, we plant ourselves out in the community to engage with 20 and 30-somethings, et cetera then how will we connect community life with church life and daily life supported by online life, the things that they'll find online in digital formats? See, I don't see like a website as a static thing. I see it as a dynamic thing that's, engaged, that's connected to stuff. It doesn't exist just on its own entity. All this is interconnected for me. It's a network. And then how will online life, what we do online, the way we curate great resources to make available to our people. So just imagine in the 40 days of Lent that you've provided a rich online context for living Lent daily, no matter what age or generation you are, accessible 24-7, 365. Well, now how will online life 
connect to my daily life. I have this accessible every day, a devotion every day, a, a, a scripture reading every day, whatever, and connect back to what, how we celebrate Lent here in church life. Sundays, maybe a retreat experience, guest speaker, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. How are you doing with that? Let me do, let me do examples. I, I want to bring this lens because I don't want you to think about strategizing as only programming. I want you to think bigger about it. So last week, and I gave a talk at the Los Angeles Religious Congress. It's the kind of the Catholic version of Comic Con. Um, <laughs> about 25, 26, 000, well, let me tell you how big it is. They had 1,000 people register at the door. All right, there's 26,000 adults for the weekend and 15,000 teenagers who come for youth day. That's all they can take. They could take probably three times that. So they have 40-something thousand people in a weekend in, at, at, at Anaheim, next, Anaheim Convention Center next to Disneyland. So I did a, I did a presentation on families. And I, I'm going to give you two examples from that presentation. Just so you see what the possible, don't worry about the example, but think about the possibilities. And so, and I didn't talk about community life as much. How do we connect daily life and church life? That was my focusing question with them. And then how do I use online life with the content there to be the 24-7, 365 connector? And I gave them examples of how to extend church into daily life, create new formats and methods for existing programs, that's the enhancement kind of thing, and how to create brand new programming. So I'm going to do this kind of quickly, but the PowerPoint's online. You'll see it on my Lifelong Faith website. It just says LA Congress, so you can download it. So that's kind of the umbrella I kind of try to communicate. So I talked about how to build an online faith formation center. You've already got tools for that. That's relatively easy today. Um, so here's the, here's, the, here's the extended event strategy. Now, I didn't... I only had an hour and a half, so I, didn't ha I couldn't put the four scenario lens on this, but if you're thinking the four scenarios and you snap that lens on this, all kinds of possibilities pop up. So how can you extend things you do on campus into people's daily life using an online platform? So you get all three of those venues all at the same time. So whether it's Sunday worship, church year, feasts and seasons, sacraments, ritual celebrations, programming, BBS and summer camp, mission trips and service projects. You know, I use, I use the mission trip example just like BBS. The best thing about mission trip is you've got teenagers going out or adults going out there. We're, we're a whole week, they're engaged. And the best thing about mission trip, it's the whole week. The worst thing about mission trip, it's only a week. And then you have 51 more weeks until the next mission trip. How do we keep people connected to other ways to serve 24-7, 365? So, I just use a simple diagram of saying an event or program, this is your strategy, that in church life can be enhanced, expanded online into people's daily life with a talk it, learn it, act it, pray it, share it strategy. Just as an example, you can make those any words you want. So I took worship and said every Sunday, I mean every church has 52 weeks of opportunities to reach people into their daily life. These people still do come to Sunday worship. And at, at the end of an hour, an hour and a half of Sunday worship, people go home. They think about Sunday worship again next Sunday. But you don't have to anymore. So what do we do to help people study, pray, live, share what's going on at Sunday worship? With all kind of, the amount of, the abundance of free digital content that allows us to connect with people is enormous. A good friend of mine, Tom Tomasek, does this weekly wonderful video around the Sunday reading but usually the gospel. Music video, commentary, reflection. It's on the Catholic lectionary, but most weeks the revised comment of the Catholic are the same gospel reading. This was a transfiguration a week ago. Uh, I don't think I had the Bible of Faith one. That, you know, this was a Catholic group, but the kinds of things that we do, reflections on the, on the scriptures. Uh, Bible of Faith Ministry has a nice one, you know, uh, taking faith home, same kind of thing, all digital. This is, a, this is a Catholic example. Loyola Press does this wonderful thing of every week they do the reflection on the Sunday Gospel, but then they do activities for grades 1 to 3, 4 to 6, 7, 8, and the whole family. It's all free. So far, this has all been free. And so I gave the examples around worship. So this is, is kind of like a 
how do we expand worship into people's daily life and bring the online world into that to resource people? Here's an example. This was my Lent example with people. Just, again, think in those three circles. How could you craft an online Lenten ex experience for people that extends the church experience they have and helps them do Lent daily? Because okay. they're not going to be here daily, but they can access that content daily. So I just, this is just Lent in, in, in two minutes. This is Busted Halo's wonderful video that welcomes people to Lent in kind of an upbeat, uh, you know, pop culture-ish way. Chuck Knows Church, Ash Wednesday. These are all, now you're accessing all this embedded into a website. Have you ever seen Chuck Knows Church? Oh, these are great. Oh, it's like two minutes. This is what, two minutes and 15 seconds on Ash Wednesday. And it just kind of, but it, it's just anytime, any place, anywhere you can access it. This is Vibrant Faith at Home. Wait, wait, don't tell me. It's all about Lent. And then just a little quiz. Of course, the actual activity, the, the actual answers are on another sheet. Okay. For Lenten Ideas, this was an activity resource that we put up online at, at Vibrant Faith. This is day by day through Lent. You got kind of a drift of what I'm doing here. Lots of variety of things, all of them free. People can find the thing that best relates to them, but we become a resource center, and this online life complements what happens in church life to impact what they do daily life. Lenten calendar, this is an example from Catholic Relief Services. This is Busted Halo's kind of pop culture Lenten calendar. Luther Seminary, every year they do a Lenten devotional free. This was one of the synods that did a family take home free. This was Catholic Relief Services, they even have an app. I just was so proud of the fact that we have actually somebody's thinking that way. And they've always done Operation Rice Bowl, but they've always talked about faith, praying, fasting, and almsgiving. They have a whole website devoted to it. And just eating simply, actual recipes. You know, take a meal one week, once each week, eat simply. And, you know, maybe donate money to Catholic Services to give to the poor. I would, I would normally come at that at the end of the process. What are the things that are coming out of your ministry area that you think is a priority? What are your plans and designs that could connect with other ministries? So at the end of this season for that, or do you do that at the end of the Next time, in May, when we gather in May. Okay. Because once, once you have your plan, once you have your strategy and craft all of these, you have a better sense of how these things could integrate. Okay? But if you start with that, most of the discussion happens up at 30,000 feet. And what are, we actually, what are we partnering around? Well, this is what we want to partner around. Okay. You know? So... If, if I was working in the family area and we were developing this, you might say, well, we have a strong, you know, your mission and outreach, right? So we have a strong, you know, out mission, you know, service focus here. How do we collaborate and partner with you around that piece? Maybe not around the other pieces. Okay. Okay. Or maybe how do I partner with worship around some of the worship pieces that we're going to do out of the family lens? Does that make sense? So I want to bring it down to that level and say, now, now where do you see the connections? Rather than start with what are initiatives that everybody, once you start up there, you spend all your time circling the airport, you never land. So those are just examples of some of the resources that I, I used. I, might, I can give you more examples, but I want to give one more and then I'm going to turn it over to you. Or two more. You can redesign all existing programming to think about this as church life, online life, and, and uh, daily life. So think about all the things that you do as church that are one-off programs. Or think about, I always use this example, and this may not be true here at all, but just pretend. We invest, we bring four great speakers on the four Wednesdays of Lent. Top-notch people, and you know, we, we do all our traditional marketing, but in the end, you, you know who's coming. They come every year. They just hope that no one died. You could be down one. Right. So you have this wonderful Lenten program. It starts at 7.30. It ends at 9. Great speakers. And at 9.01, it's gone forever. Never to be seen again. When in fact, none of that has to happen. And we know that today. Because we can take anything that we currently are doing and think about the four scenarios in this and repurpose those things, redesign those, to reach a wider audience beyond the physical time in which we do something. So, here's my Latin speaker. This is your church with everybody coming. And we know that there's hundreds of people out there 
who couldn't make a fixed time on Wednesday night. So we can stream it for those who can't get out. We can, watch, we can record it so they can watch it on their own. We can even develop a little study guide for a small group that wants to meet at Starbucks or somebody's home to talk about it. We can put it in our online library, and we can develop some online content around that presentation. And all of a sudden, the four-week Lenten series lives and is available in daily life because of online life. And the best thing is, Lent will be back. <laughs> and those four become part of our learning options next year, even as we do new content for our four-week Lenten series. You, can you imagine how much content you all generate as a church every year that at the end of the year is gone into the ether of the galaxy? If you just simply recorded it, and then thought about multi-purposing it, and then targeting different audiences with it, you wouldn't have to go much further. And you're already spending the money. As long as you got high school kids, you can record anything. <laughs> it's true, isn't it? I have a church that, oh, we have to buy equipment. I said, no, no, no. Ask the high school kids what they have available to them. And then get out of their way. So think, oh yeah, I mean it's just like, yeah, I'm an old guy, just get out of the way, let the people who are visual and media oriented, who have it in their DNA, let them do it. I'm missing that genetic mutation. <laughs> so you can redesign anything. You know, I use the example oftentimes of Google Hangouts, of using that as a way to, to, to do a lot of what we do here, you can put it in a different context. And you can design new programs starting with, and then this is the case of when you can start out in the community and bring it back in. So here's an online parent resource center, which you can set up in two hours, no problem at all, an hour. Because the content exists already. So none of this is, none of this where you're creating content. So if you look at this and say, oh, we'll go, content. no. I'm just being a great curator of the riches of all these content. What's that? Well, I want to. I would certainly want to curate it to make sure it's all engaging. But TED Talks haven't had any problem putting up a thousand TED Talks and counting. I mean, I'd love the number of hits they get every hour. I mean, just it's on everything. It runs the whole gamut. Now the quality is very good, okay, but they're using that platform and saying we have a diverse people have diverse learning needs. We're going to address those diverse learning needs. Now, everything doesn't have to go up online. I don't mean that that everything should, but I'm saying you now have this wrinkle, this wonderful uh, asset to think about when you're strategizing. And so you say, all right, it's a church life program. It can live online, so people can access it whenever they want, 24-7, 365. Brought to you by St. Michael's. You know, so it's, 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 it's your presence and relationship building in a different way. Now, you have to be a good curator. You know, this works, this won't work. So there's things that you will do or not do. So here's an example where I started without a gathered program. And I, in fact, I've said in this, this is an actual little sample web page I created, which was, um, it's so hard to get parents with their busy schedules to come out to stuff. So the message to them is going to be, imagine preschool parents, imagine parents, stay home tonight. We're coming to you. In fact, if you want, gather other parents in your neighborhood, break out a nice bottle of Cabernet or a six pack of your local microbrew and have some fun. All right. From 9 to 10 o'clock, we're coming to you with a webinar. And it's going to be the first Wednesdays of every month. 45-minute presentation. By the way, the speaker can be anywhere as long as that speaker has access to the internet. You can do it in the Google Plus Hangout for free. Or you can buy a contract with Adobe Connect or one of those to deliver the webinar. <coughs> OK, 
Okay, and it's not two ways, so it's not like a television studio. You, you're basically broadcasting it, and in the chat room, people are putting up their questions the rest. 45 minute presentation, 15 minute question answer, done. But you recorded it. So if you miss Wednesday night and you want to watch it Friday night, it's available. And it goes into my parenting library. And over the course of the next three years, I develop a world-class parenting library that I can repurpose and reuse in a hundred different ways. So we're going to come to you. They can register online, do all that stuff. And then I'm going to build content that I haven't created. I, I went to a website called Parent Further, and I've got great background on your child growing up. I've got a wonderful, another webinar you want to go deeper on positive parenting. I've got a great article on positive parenting. I've got a great article on what makes a good parent in terms of parenting skills. And I've textured just three web pages that are on this theme for my, well, I forget what it, yeah, my, this is my spring-ish programming for four months, February, March, April, and May. I'm reaching people, I'm not asking them to come to anything. In fact, I'm advertising by saying, stay home, we're coming to you. So the starting point is online, daily life, and this is brought to you by St. Michael's, and we do the variety of other things as well. Now, I know one church that took this approach, and, the la and, they, at, and what they do is they have four webinars, and the fifth one is on-site. They invite people to a gathering at church to talk about what they learn, and they have a guest speaker. Turnout is really, really good. Why? You build a relationship for four, and you've asked them only to come out once at a fixed time. And of course, that's recorded too, in case you missed it. Can I see a thread here? Don't lose the content you generate. So the strategy behind all of this is to think in terms of a faith of a system. Well, I better not run how you do this is to think in terms of a system that allows you to interconnect these four arenas, these four contexts. And I think no matter what you're doing here, I think this could be helpful. And it's not about money. It's about thinking strategically about that. So, so Nancy, that's, that's also part of the solution to how do we co once we develop a strategy, now I've got another vehicle for online life that I can connect to from wherever ministry I'm doing. So you don't have to duplicate. That's, that's a, the best way to say it. I need to duplicate it. I need to connect with it. Lisa, just, it, it, just to know that you've got that in your back pocket as a way to think about it can help. And, and, and for me, pastoral care is not, it, it's also preventative. And so this might be more helpful, not in the responding to an emergency, but in the more preventative side of how do we build up family, well, I'll take family as an example, family assets, family strengths, that kind of stuff around critical issues. Um, especially people, when you think about serving people in scenario two and three, would they pick up the phone? Or would their first be, response be to go to their phone to look for help? online. I don't know the answer to that, but I, I'd, I would try to find it out. So I'm not saying this, this, this lends itself to every single one of your initiatives. It's not normative. It's simply descriptive. Um, and it may be distinction between emergency and preventative stuff. But even, I mean, I've watched some churches take rites like funerals and just wrap an online 24-7 event around um, resources around grieving, uh, videos, connections, that kind of stuff that help the grieving process after the funeral. And so it's available. Whether people use it or not, you'll determine that over the course of a year. But I do think there's some projects for which this would connect, and there's some other ones that it just wouldn't work with. That's okay. Just the, just the fact that you know you have those strategies available can be, can be, can be helpful. And it doesn't need to be always programming. It doesn't need to be always programming. I mean, like most churches don't do a lot after a funeral because they haven't got any staff like, well, you have, 
but you know, the staff need to be able to do that. But the online world and some partnering there, connection can be really helpful to people. The one thing I didn't show on the parent one was, I put on the parenting site, the last thing was, Boys Town in Nebraska has an 800 number that's open 24 7, 365, where if you've got a problem or as a parent, you can call that number and get a trained therapist on the other side for free who can talk to you about things that are going on in your life. They should be able to find that on our website. So far, so good? So here's two big ways to think about this. How do I use the four scenarios in my strategy? And how do I think about these arenas? Just know you have those tools to become more complete in the way you do a strategy. All right? Any other questions, thoughts, oh my gods? Don't be so happy about this. I, I'm not, I can't answer that, obviously. But what I will say is this. You might want to try living your way into a new reality and seeing what you discover. That's why I like the prototype approach, which is to say, okay, what would it be like if we were fill in the blank uh, for, the com for the broader world? And we, we saw that. What would that look like? Let's try some small experiments to see what that looks like. We're not going to change the whole church or have a you know, survey or, you know, let's just live our way into that and then see what we learn through that experiment. Because we're not stopping anything necessarily, though you might change some things you're doing, but we're, we, we want to try and learn what it would be like if we were this kind of a church in this area. Because you already are out in the community doing stuff. I mean, that's not, that's not different. But, but if, we thought, if we thought of ourselves that way, what could that look like through the different projects people do? And I would just suggest you might want to, as a way of thinking about it, you might want to live your way into that and then reflect on that theologically every, every year as you move through this to say, what is that teaching us about church, about mission, about our identity? Rather than start the other way and saying, okay, how do we rethink of ourselves and then what if you lived into it and see what, what you discover? Just one way of thinking it through. And it gives you a lot of freedom to say, we're gonna try some new things and that's a good thing and we're gonna learn from those but they're going to be small-scale experiments, not big church-wide initiatives. Bottom-up rather than top-down, so to speak. And we're going to learn by doing that. And then we're going to become the spokespeople for what that looks like. And the people who participated become spokespeople for what that... That's a whole different approach to change. I like that approach a lot better. It's kind of change... A lot of times we get change from the center out. I like change from the out towards the center. Try some things out here, mess around, make a lot of mistakes, revise stuff, and then keep on moving in with it as you, as you expand it to a wider audience. There's lots of approaches to change. Mine is not the only way, but I just like, I like this approach because it gives us a chance to mess around, learn some stuff, try some stuff before it really counts. That's what prototyping is. We're not going to go out to our audience until we've messed around enough to try some stuff and see how it works. I know, church and experimenting don't normally go in the same sentence. Especially when you hear from a Roman Catholic, oh my God. Roman Catholic and experimenting, oh, you, know, that's a, you must be a Protestant. Um, other questions? Because I'm going to get... I'm, because, we're moving into design work. You're good? Okay. So here's what I'd like you to do. We're gonna use a, we're gonna use a process, I won't go back, I'll explain this later, but I'll do step one. We're gonna use a mind mapping process. Because what this will allow you to do is kind of graphically take, an initi take a challenge. Challenge is gonna go right in the middle. Challenge is gonna go right in the middle. And we're gonna start talking about how do we respond to this challenge. You got the four scenarios, you got the, the Church life, daily life, online, community life. How we respond to that challenge. You've got colored markers. Do not consider this an art project. This is going to get messy 
Like, you know, people went, oh, I want to get it just right. No, it's brainstorming. You know, you're not supposed to get it right. You're supposed to get it wrong, right? Here's the way mind map. How many of you have ever done mind mapping? All right, so, so many of you know, okay. So the key with mind mapping is this. The big, the big lines here, I call those the trunks, okay? Those are the big ideas. So the big ideas of how we can respond. So if, if I was going to put down um, uh, my, a new family initiative, all right, we want to reach out to him, one of my big trunks might be we're going to do webinars to parents. All right, that's a big, that's a big idea. Okay? So get the big ideas on the trunks. Okay? And then off of the trunks, the branches allow you to, to dig deeper into it. Well, we can do this, or we can do this, we can do a webinar on this, a webinar on this, we can do this, et cetera. Okay? So as you get deeper into this, you get more specific. This is deliberately not linear. You might put a trunk up there, and you might come back to it 20 minutes later with some other ideas. And everybody can contribute to everybody else's ideas. Okay? Just try not to talk over it. And there's no need to discuss them in terms of like, you don't have to make any decisions about this. Just get it all up there so you can see the map. Okay? So trunks are the big ideas, strategies, programs, resource, whatever it might be. And the branches coming off of that are how we're going to do this. Examples, activities, whatever, that implement that. Okay, does that make sense? So here's a mind map of somebody's vacation. Well, I gotta get out of church, you gotta just do something. You know, right? So this is their holiday, and their big ones were where, I think it's, no, when, bring uh, friends, accommodations, where, and transportation. And those are the big trunks. And then off of that, try this with your family. Like, you know, mind map your next vacation. That will be really a kick. Kids do this in school all the time, by the way, with projects. And then off of that, they have solutions to how we're going to do transportation, where, where we're going to go, what accommodations, et cetera, et cetera. So in the middle, your, your, your first challenge, you're going to do a couple of these, so you'll get good at it. By the end of the day, you'll have a PhD in mind mapping. Lines, big ideas for taking, for responding to that adaptive challenge. Branches off the trunks, ways to implement that, activities, strategies, et cetera, that bring that, will bring that to life. Okay? So you get more specific as you move out. And sometimes you even have a branch off a branch. Don't worry about getting it right. Worry about getting all the ideas out. Okay? I want to do the first mind map on the first adaptive challenge before lunch. Okay? So we have about a half hour to work on the first one. Remember, four scenarios, four contexts, have fun. Don't edit yourself. Everything is possible. As you've been doing some mind mapping and I walked around, um, any questions about what you were doing? flow pretty well, generate ideas. Okay, so let's get a sense of what people chose as, just so you can hear what everybody else is doing. Just give us the adaptive challenge, okay? Not the ideas, just give us a central adaptive challenge in one or two sentences, okay? Let's we'll start all the way over here, and real loud. Next step from this on the same project. So once you get one project done, you'll see the whole picture is, and this is in the handout, so you, you can refer back to this, but you've done one, now number two, you've got lots of ideas. Um, what projects do you want to move ahead with? Um, if, if, you're, if your planning has been basically one big project, you've already done that check mark. Okay. And so what we want to do is we want to now kind of sketch out, based on all those ideas, what I'll call a version 1.0 of the project. Now you may have already gotten that far as well. Okay. So if you have, that's great, check that off the list. Which is version 1.0 includes what the content, 
kind of our strategies, our activities, resource materials needed, budget leadership needs, those kinds of things, right? And in many ways, you can add that to your mind map. So if you've got a distinct project for an audience, which many have, so, this, so you're, you're moving ahead through this, make sure you've got in your mind map a, a branch that goes, a trunk that goes off around content, strategies, I think most people have that, resource the materials needed, budget really is something you're going to need to address, but not today, in the sense that you'll get bogged down in that. And leadership needs. Who do we need to make this happen? Okay. And then you're ready for really developing a plan for piloting this, and you probably want another sheet of newsprint, because my suggestion is this, you th and this is just this is just 2014, 2015. You can change the years in this very easily, but after today, the work on this project will be design it. I mean, actually craft it. You're not going to do it today. We're going to sketch out a couple of these, but actually dig down and design it. Today, though, identify the group you want to prototype this with. Okay. So make sure built in is to say, before we do this in a large scale with our whole audience, we want to prototype this with some smaller group or smaller groups. Okay. And then talk about when you're going to evaluate the effectiveness of this. So your prototype can last a month, six months, or a year. It just depends on the project. And then you're going to want to evaluate the effectiveness with the people you piloted this with. So that you kind of pull them in as partners in this process. Okay. Meaning what? All right, so youth and the youth team is doing uh, four stepping stones. Okay. Now, they can pilot four stepping stones, or they can say we're going to pilot one in the next six months. And then we're going to pilot the second one and the third one. So in 18 months, we're going to have them all up and running. Okay. So you can bring that lens to this. So it doesn't have to be an all or nothing. You can, you can work your way into it. Okay. Now, oftentimes on a project, you might try three or four different prototypes. Let's go back to the giving one. You might have three or four things in the hopper, and you say, we just want to know which one of these will work here. They're different. They're new initiatives. We, we haven't done these things before. Let's try three or four, identify a target audience for, for these each one, and let's try them. And then at this point, you make a decision to say, Move ahead, or uh, that was a nice experiment, but that's a bomb. Don't ever do that again, all right? Or revise. So you'll be at a point after you evaluate the effectiveness of it to say, move ahead or stop. Okay. If you move ahead, you're most likely to do some redesign based on the evaluation. And now the second phase, version 2.0, is expand that. So if I was doing maybe a family program, I might do it for a couple of months and just invite a couple dozen families to participate. See how it works. With my goal of scaling it up in the 2014-2015 program year. So I pilot a couple, I get a lot of feedback, I learn what works, what doesn't work with our families here. We've got a basic model and the rest. Okay. Then I can expand it to everybody and of course continue evaluating. By the third year, I've kind of integrated that into all of our offerings. We continue to grow that, continue to develop that. I would, put a, I would develop a template like that for every one of my projects that I'm going to prototype. So you might look at your list and say, you know, we're doing adult faith formation. We're going to try three or four different adult faith formation offerings, <coughs> something that, that's geared towards people who are already participating. We're going to try something new where we just kind of go out to the broader community and do adult faith formation that we open up to everybody. Maybe it's a webinar-based program. Maybe it's a series we do at the YMCA. I don't know. But we're going to try, and we're going we're to try these different pro projects over the next 18 months, and then we're going to come to a point where we evaluate that and see which ones we want to continue and which ones were nice experiments, learned a lot. Don't do that again. So this is the experimental mindset that's adaptive response. Try a variety of things. And so we, let's take the worship example. So maybe we do this, this different, and we try this actually in two different formats. We have a Sunday night perhaps and a Wednesday night. Okay. Or we try two or three different ways in which we're going to do worship. You know, kind of a little modified or, oh my God, where'd this come from worship? You know, yeah, that's the continuum, all right? 
You know, see, so what you do is, you, or maybe we experiment with different audiences. We try this one targeted to, to kind of 20, 30 somethings, or this one targeted to, to families for whom Sunday morning is just a minefield of competition. You know, with soccer, basketball, baseball, blah, 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 blah. And so we're going to do a Wednesday night with it. Like, so you could bring that experimental mindset to say, and, it, and it's just going to be a short term kind of thing, six months, whatever we're going to do. And then we're going to evaluate that and decide how we want to move ahead. What do we learn from doing it? The big change that I want you to have is this. What are we learning by doing this? Not checking off this on my program list. All right, got that next, got this next. No, no, no. This is the learning cycle. Because if you're trying to reach the other scenarios besides number one, if you're trying to reach new audiences, you're trying to move the setting out online or out in the community, you're trying to target a different age group, all of that is learning. And what you learn not only needs to be shared with everybody in the room and the whole, all the leadership in the church, but it's going to inform what you do as your next step. And you just keep on thinking that way. If you can think experimental, learning, this process really works well. If you think this is where you designed it, we got it out there, they didn't like it, so what? The heck with them, they're all wrong, let's move ahead. Not that that ever happens in church, that we ever blame people for not coming to our program and never think twice about, maybe it's my program that's the problem. People are just fine. Okay. Does that make sense? Enough info on how to design that? Okay. Craft your first three-year time frame. Design, prototype, evaluate, and here were the questions I had. Identify the target audience, implement. The other thing about this is, is this is a leadership question. When you're implementing a new project, obviously the people sitting here are going to take a big role in the leadership of that. But if you can build in a leadership development strategy, just in time learning, what I mean by that is this. While you're doing this three years, if you can layer in, bring some people on who are going to start working side by side with you in the beginning of the pilot design. And even though you'll take a lead and they'll take a supportive role, let them work hand in hand with you in the design and the implementation of the pilot. Because then the result of that is you're going to have higher ownership. You're also going to have people who are going to be trained just by doing it. You're not going to say, come out for a workshop, because they won't. Right? We're going to design this, and the training is actually embedded in the project. So at the end of this, you actually have a cadre of people who can either launch this or work with you in launching this on a wider scale. So build in the leadership strategy from number one all the way through, so that you have a leadership development strategy on all of your projects. Does that make sense? The other thing about the target audience advantage is this. If you're reaching an audience you have not reached before, and they really like what you just did with them, they're going to talk to other people about it. So you're kind of building in this social marketing media kind of thing that's going to happen because these people are benefiting from what you've done. The other thing about piloting is this. Way back in the early 1900s, one of the first major sociological projects was called the Westinghouse Project. And the Westinghouse Project was this. A group of sociologists were hired by Westinghouse to do the study to improve productivity on the, on the, on the, on the floor, okay, basically where the workers were. And what they did is they, they were studying a variety of things. And one of the things they studied was the effect of lighting on worker productivity. Okay. And so they raised the lighting, they lowered the lighting, they reduced the lighting, they enhanced the lighting, they changed the light bulbs. You know, it's Westinghouse, so it wasn't hard. <laughs> and no matter what they did to test the effect of lighting, productivity kept on going up. Then they tried heat, hotter, colder, productivity kept on going up. And so they realized that the very fact that they were being observed and part of a research study, that factor was what was increasing productivity. The fact that they were being studied, okay? This is the benefit of a prototype group. You get the chance to have a group that becomes insiders to the project. It's kind of your first test group. 
that alone is going to enhance their participation. And two, if it works, it's going to enhance the word of mouth that's going to go out about what you've just done. That's why I think prototyping is so good for you, but also for people. Questions? Grab a sheet of newsprint, map it out in detail, a three-year plan. Don't be afraid to put dates, audience, what you want to do. I'm going to start the second process, and you can finish with the current one. So, ready? Here's my question. What are you learning? Not about what you did. What are you, I, don't want, I, don't the, I don't want the product of what you did. I want, I'm interested in what are you learning as you're, de, as you're designing? By getting into the process, it, things are popping. Yeah, I, I did take one of the lights and focus it on your table, so that thought that might. <laughs> <laughs> <Time to heat up>. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> what are you learning? Yeah, and. You can think out of the box and not worry that I'm, I'm, I'm imperiling the whole church. Okay? Because, well, and the reason why I like this process is, because I've been part of all these kinds of, over these years, is that things are going to continue moving while you're innovating, experimenting, and then what you're learning here is going to come back and start transforming what you currently do here. Without saying, we're going to change all this stuff, and then getting the natural what? You wave our blue, boom, you know, the big the, the pushback. So things will continue while you try new things, and then they will come back and transform what you're currently doing. That's what's going to happen. What else you're learning? What else you're learning? Yeah, and then taking the camp experience in the diocese and then expanding that in all kinds of ways, yeah, that's just a, I mean, I, that, that's just a platform for great experiments to reach people. No, it, but it, but the longer we do something, the more at home we become in what we do. And sometimes we need to, 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 to kind of experiment off of that and say, let's, like as I was describing, let's do a, a parallel here with a different audience or different approach and let's see what that nets without stopping what we're doing here, just trying something for a whole new audience. And I think, yeah, it, sometimes we do try to pour every, well, we try to pour everything into our current vessel, our current vehicle, and it wasn't meant to do that. It wasn't set up to do that originally. And there's also, I mean, we have the four scenario perspective, but certainly a big piece of what I hear as I walk around the room is there's also a generational perspective. The 60-year-old boomer plus crowd is not the 20, 30-something crowd, even though they may be living at home with their parents, you know. <laughs> But it's not, that's not, it's a, generationally there's a lot of differences between millennials and Xers and boomers and builders. And we have to bring that generational perspective into our strategies. Because people, because it, it's just, it's the generational differences are real. They're not competing, they're just real differences in terms of how we think about ministry. What else are you learning? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know where we lost control. I don't know if we ever really had it, but I know we don't have any now. We just don't. So it's influence. It's uh, it's 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 relationships. Uh, that's where that's where we make a difference. 
But no, we don't. I mean, there's some churches I work with that come to training and the rest. They exert so much time trying to control the lives of like families and the rest. And I say, you know, let, let it go. You'll be a happier human being. You know, I'm saving you therapy bills. Stop trying to control people's lives. People's lives have changed. Develop an adaptive response so you can influence them. Um, it's really, really hard. Because the old model was kind of a command control model. No, you're absolutely right. It's how you get there. And so um, we could have started in uh, affinity groups or age groups or life cycle stages. Uh, in fact, what I'm going to do in the third workshop is get what I'll call coordination. I don't use the collaboration word because everybody, you know, we, we done, you know we, we've been there, done that, and we're, we're over collaboration. We're moving on, all right? But coordination. So if, if, we've all, if, we, if I have three table groups that have targeted uh, young families, how do they sit down and coordinate their efforts so that they don't overlap, they don't compete, they're, they're working from the same page, even though they're in different distinct ministries? So that'll be, a, that'll be a layer that we'll layer into this once your plants are percolated in your area. Okay? So you say, uh, coming out of pastoral care or, can, or family or young adult or young adult faith formation, these are the areas that are most urgent and most pr big priorities for us. Well, if we, if we should identify a common target audience, let's talk about how to coordinate with that. And so we'll do that in, in May. Okay. So I didn't start with that. I started with, with, in a sense, with your assets and strengths from your ministry area. But if we identify some common audiences, let's see how we can work together on that. We'll, we'll try to integrate that in May. So we're going to get there. We're just not there yet. It just depends, number one, it depends what kind of data you have. Um, but I, I, like I suggested the pastoral care folks that they might want to, they wanted to target 20, 30 somethings or young families. So they do some focus groups around life issues and how pastoral care interfaces with that. Um, I like focus groups a little bit better because I, you get up close and personal, you can ask some great questions, that kind of stuff. Um, Depending on my area, if I've got to do some demographic work and the rest, and I'm able to access that in the church, that's great, okay? Um, but I find most churches are, are they, uh, coordinate and, and really mine their data very well. So uh, it comes in in the planning, um, but usually when I recommend a research method, I will, I'll talk less about survey and talk more about focus groups. You, you'll actually learn more in a focus group format. And I've had churches that, that start with focus groups, and then they do a survey with, with questions that came out of the focus group that they want to know more about. But surveys are really hard because the people who will fill out a survey are the ones who are there on Sunday, by and large. You're not going to get people who are not affiliated or spiritual but not religious filling out a survey from St. Michael's. They're just not going to do that. But they will come to a focus group if you're invited by their friend and you serve great refreshments. Hospitality, hospitality, and hospitality. Yeah. So I like focus groups better. So far, so good. Let's, uh, let's do this. I'm going to set up the next task and then take a stretch break. What I'd like you to do is take your second, and we'll have time for one more, your second big adaptive challenge and exactly the same process, though this time you're going to be better at it, okay? Because you've been through it the first time. So... You're going to want to, trust me, trust me. All right, so same thing. Develop a mind map, mind map your second adaptive challenge, next one that's important, and after you mind mapped it, develop your three-year plan. So that when you're finished today, you have two, you have two mind maps, two plans, and two timelines, okay? That's the product for today. And what I want to do at the end of the day is make sure we get the product. So we'll, I'll, I'll, we'll figure out a way for you to get that to me so I know what you're working on and we can share it with everybody, okay? Obviously, we'll not be able to share the mind maps per se, but we'll get that data out to people so you know what everybody's doing that would allow what Lisa said in terms of kind of coordinating across the group for May, okay? And then third thing 
if there's another adaptive challenge that you want to tackle in this time frame, then I would suggest that you use exactly the same process and do that between now and the May meeting, okay? So that we'll, in May, we're working with implementation, implementation, and coordination, okay? Take your second challenge, mind map it, then move to this time frame, take about an hour or so to do that, because then I have a wrap up I want to do together. We'll take a stretch break first. We are going to want to do some integration in the, in the May workshop. So let's get a sense of what people are doing, just to be able to hear what's your, what's your target audience, adults, whatever, and what, what do you see yourself doing? Let's start here, adults. Shh, listen up. There, there's a great line in the business world about change. And it's better off to kill your own program than to have it die a slow, painful death. You know, and that's what happens in the product world. You see that all the time, you know, that, that organizations go through this slow pain. You know this product is just gonna, it's gonna tank because it's been, and they just hang on, they hang on. You're better off to kill off your own than to have somebody else kill it off on you, you know? So you can create new energy and go some new direction, you know? Um, Great example of this, by the way, is Google has no problem stopping doing things. I mean, they'll throw 100 things out there, and they may kill off 75 of them, but they found the 25 that worked. And those things they invest in. But I've watched over the last five years, products I've used, like Google Read and the rest, just go out of existence because they just, that wasn't their future. And they brought it to a, they gave it plenty, you know, nine months from now, six months, they clocked down until it's gone, all right? So they gave you plenty of warning, but it's gone, you know? Remember iGoogle where you could do your own look? Gone, we don't, stop messing up our front page, okay? So they stopped doing a whole variety of things so they could put time and energy into doing other things. I think churches are the same way. You know, you have, especially a big church where you have a lot of initiatives, how do we phase these out to bring these online. And it's an art, there's no science to it, there's an art, but knowing when to say that served its purpose, it has a shelf life, thank you, we're gonna, but this is what's gonna replace it. And it's really important because you only have, lip, there's a, there is finite time and resources, and how you spend them is really important. I wish there was a trend, but oftentimes we wait so long that it dies right in front of us. And then you lose all momentum, all energy, and all that goodwill that you could have transformed into something else. And so I, I think, by and large, I watch churches hang on to things that they know. It's not like it's a news bulletin. It's a secret in plain sight. Everybody knows it's not working. But rather than say, we're going to stop that to do something new, innovative, creative, that'll reach our people, we hang on to those things. I don't know if I see any trend. The only trend I see is people hang on way too long. Way too long. And it sucks energy and time and creativity that needs to go to other things because the world, because our people are changing so dramatically and so quickly. Um, that's the bi biggest mismatch I often see in a congregation is the mismatch between the speed at which we adapt and the changes going on in the world around us. It's, it's, it's almost like there's like a, um, there's a time lapse, it's like an episode of Star Trek, you know, that, that people are in two different time, you know, uh, there was one of those episodes in which uh, Jordy and somebody else were in a different time lapse, and they were watching what was going on, but nobody could see them because the time was work. I feel churches are someplace like that. Like the world is changing, and we're kind of going slow motion, you know. So that's the biggest gap that I see that that we do have control over our response. We have no control of what's going on out there, but our response to that we have. I think sometimes we hang on too long. No. 
but we should be experts at transformation. We should be experts at dying and rising. That's why we need funerals for things that we stop doing. To ritualize in some way. Prayer, ritual. I'm serious. That, and this is, what's, this is what's dying. And this, We should be good at the Paschal mystery. Not just once a year on Good Friday and Easter Sunday. I mean, there are some things that have, that have served us so well for decades. It's thank you. And now something new is coming on board. And, and to be able to manage that. It's not an easy process, but it's a necessary one because you want to keep growing. And you want to serve people you're not serving. Other thoughts? So here's the last thing I need you to do. And this is for me, okay? I need you to, num number one, make sure that what those things you have in front of you, you bring back in May. You can type them up, you do whatever you want. I don't need them this time, okay? But I need you to make sure you bring them back in May. That's the basis of planning. But what I do need from you is this, on a sheet of paper, just a regular sheet of paper. I need, to know, I need you to tell me what the two big projects you're working on are, okay? And then resources or assistance you would find helpful between now, well, for the May workshop. Resources, assistance, examples, whatever, that you would like help with, and that becomes my homework between now and May, okay? Keep the, what you have. On a sheet of paper, there are two projects, what they are, just describe them in a sentence each, and then what resources would be helpful, assistance, examples, to help you move ahead to the next phase of planning, okay? As we wrap up, what would help your team for next time is if someone actually typed up the newsprint, all right? Keep the newsprint, but you're going to want to work with that data next time. Because here's what I want to do next time. I want to go off this page and say, all right, let's go actually into the design. What's it going to look like? So when I, get, when I have your material here, I'm going to try to give you examples of what other churches have done or other organizations. So I'll, I'll use preschool as an example. What are some churches that have great preschool websites? What are some great resources for a preschool website? Who's done some things to, you know, through programmatically to try to reach? So I can put together examples like family programming. All right, so who's done some family stuff? What are some great family programming resources? What are the, et cetera. So, I can put a list together and I'll put it on my website and then I'll just link it. I'll make sure Shelly knows and I'll make everybody who's uh, sent me a report last time, I'll make you all know. So you see where it's all in one location. So you can refer to that over the next month, take a look at it so that when we come together in May, because with Easter in the middle, it's going to be May tomorrow morning. Um, but you'll get a chance to say, okay, let's go deeper. We need to leave the May workshop with, this is our design, here's our timeline, Here's what we're going to implement, because all because the, because the May workshop is all about implementation, okay, and moving ahead. So as you look at your report, get it typed up, get it to your team members, but also bring whatever you need to do design work to the meeting in May, and I'll do my part, have that available to you as well, okay. And even though we didn't go online today, you will find going online next time with resources helpful. So definitely bring a computer and you can connect or a tablet, okay? Um, any last questions about between now and May? Okay. Thanks for working hard on this and, and working through it. Um, uh, and early happy Easter, because that's going to be here like tomorrow. So thank you.